Hey everyone, welcome to the Real Estate Classroom YouTube channel. My name is Paul Vicheski and my mission is simple. That is to help you pass the real estate exam the first time. Hey, before we get started, give this video a thumbs up, hit that red subscribe button, click on that notification bell. Okay, we're going to continue our vocabulary word series. I hope to have this finished up in the coming weeks. Uh, but today we're going to do 196 through 203 of 300 and every one of the concepts that we're going to talk about today all evolve around federal laws, environmental laws that impact us in the real estate community and you have to know them for the real estate exam. Now, first of all, our first key term we're going to talk about is the Environmental Protection Agency, commonly referred to as the EPA. Now, I know most of you already know what the EPA is and what they do, but the EPA is a federal, federal organization and their job is to uh, write regulation, environmental regulation, and then enforce those regulations. So they are the enforcement branch for the federal government regarding environmental issues. The EPA, you got to know that for your real estate exam because almost everything, every one of these laws that we're talking about in this video, it is the EPA that's tasked with enforcing those laws. Now, the first federal law I want to talk about is the Federal Control Act. Now, the only thing that you really have to know about this law is it established a partnership between the federal government and insurance companies to provide you and I with flood insurance. So if you buy a home that's in a floodplain that's been designated by FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, if, if FEMA designates a certain area of land as a floodplain and your home is located in that floodplain, you just can't go down to your Allstate insurance agent and get uh, insurance for in case there's a flood. You get your homeowner's insurance, but then you have to get uh, what's called flood insurance. Now, flood insurance is very expensive. And quite frankly, because flood insurance, the damage from floods are so extensive, it would put most companies out of business. So therefore, most companies wouldn't offer flood insurance. This law provided a joint venture where the federal government will work with companies, insurance companies, to make flood insurance somewhat affordable for those that live in floodplains. And that's the key thing you have to know about the Flood Control Act. The next one is the Coastal Zone Management Act. This law was passed and the law is designed to protect our beaches of America. We know that there's a lot of development that happens around beaches. People put up condos, they, you know, highways, etc. All of that is done in conjunction and according to the Coastal Zone Management Act because the law is designed to prevent our beaches from eroding away. It also provides wildlife habitat in those coastal zones and pro provides sheltering areas for marine life. So that is all done under the Coastal Zone Management Act. Number 199 is the Clean Water Act. Now, contrary to popular belief, the Clean Water Act does not provide uh, clean water for us. It has nothing to do with drinking water, believe it or not. I think that... that um, I think that myth is out there because of politicians. But the Clean Water Act was originally known as the Federal Water Pollution Control Act of 1948. It was amended in 1972, and the name was changed to the Clean Water Act. You probably need to know that 1972 date. That's when the Clean Water Act was passed. Now, what it does is it's designed to protect wetlands across the United States. Wetlands include swamps, marshes, bogs, river overflows, mud flats, uh, ponds. If you have a pond on your farm, the Clean Water Act governs what you can and can't do with that pond. All right, so that is the Clean Water Act. Our next federal law we have to know is called the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. I know I misspelled act. I spelled it A-C-Y, it should be A-C-T. Now, this particular law does a couple of things that you as a real estate professional have to know. Number one, it establishes all the rules and regulations and compliance, uh, the compliance part for underground storage tanks. So if you have underground storage tanks on a property that you own or that, that you manage, then this law governs that underground storage tank. Number two is it, uh, it governs the storage and the disposal of hazardous waste. 
All right, so let me let me explain what I mean here. So let's say that you go to Lowe's and you buy a gallon of paint. You you paint your wall and you have a half a gallon left over and you put it on the shelf in your house or, or in the closet in your house or in the, on the shelf in the garage. That is a hazardous substance. Why? Because you can still use it and it has it has not expired yet. But let's say you forget about it and three years later you look at the can and you go, oh wow, hey, that's a... Um, uh, that's expired. I can't use it anymore. Well, now it's gone from a hazardous substance because it's no longer in its form that it was originally intended to to be used as to a hazardous waste. Now you just can't throw it in the landfill. You have to take it to a recycling center or someplace because this particular law governs how you can store that hazardous waste and also how you can dispose of it. I guess uh, the best way to, dis dis uh, to describe this is using latex paint. Latex paint, when you buy it at the store and it hasn't expired, is a hazardous substance, but you can actually put it down the drain. I'm not saying to do that, but that's one method of disposal because it's a hazardous substance. But once it expires, it is no longer a hazardous substance, it's a hazardous waste, so you can't put it down the drain anymore. You have to dispose of it in accordance with this law. Are you ever going to really need to know this for the general run-of-the-mill, you know, residential real estate agent? Probably not, but um, let me tell you something. that If you, um, if you manage industrial property, you're going to have to know this law inside and out. The next one is the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act. Now, this law does a couple of things. First of all, it established a slush fund. So money was available to clean up hazardous waste sites and toxic sites. All right. So that's the first thing. The second thing is it provides for the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, to go after the landowners, both present and past, to help them clean up a site. So let me give you an example. Let's say that you purchased a salvage yard that had a thousand junk cars and you sold the parts. Well, those cars leaked oil, antifreeze, brake fluid, etc., and contaminated the soil. The EPA comes in and they designate your property, your salvage yard, as a toxic waste site or a hazardous waste site. Now, you probably don't have the money to pay, pay for the cleanup. So the government uses the money in those funds to pay for the cleanup. But the EPA, the federal government, has a right to come after you, but not only you, also previous landowners, to help pay for the cleanup of that salvage yard. The other thing that this law provides for is it allows the federal government to dissolve any any entities, legal entities that may be there, maybe you own this salvage yard as a limited liability company, it allows the government to go in and dissolve those corporations so they can come after your personal assets to also pay for the cleanup. So not only are you the current owner, potentially a responsible party for cleanup, but also any previous owners. That's the thing about this law. Uh, that impacts, and it does impact us in the real estate community because there were a lot of those salvage yard type properties that were out there. Number 202, the Safe Drinking Water Act. This is the actual law that does deal with clean water. Um, this law establishes the minimum standards for, for uh, safe drinking water. So your, your public utility that provides you the water that comes out of the faucet uh, they have to comply with minimum standards established by the Safe Drinking Water Act. It also provides standards and methods and processes for that utility to purify that water that they may get out of underground wells or out of the river. It also provides the same minimum standards for well water as well. So it's not the Clean Water Act. It's the Safe Drinking Water Act that provides those minimum standards. Number 203, the Lead-Based Paint Hazard Reduction Act. And now, first of all, you have to know that it was passed in 19, 1992. And because lead is extremely dangerous to human beings, and it is, it's, it's exceptionally dangerous to women who are pregnant and children. And I'm not I'm under, understating the, the, uh, the danger here. 
I have seen kids that have had lead-based paint poisoning. My wife's a teacher. She's a kindergarten teacher. And I have seen some kids that have been damaged by lead-based paint. And it is no joke. So there are certain requirements that the law places on sellers, landlords, and renovators of homes built prior to 1978. Another key date that you have to know. Now, these are homes built prior to 1978, not homes built in 1978. So keep that in mind. So what are those requirements? Sellers, landlords, and renovators are required to disclose information regarding lead-based paint hazards before a tenant or a buyer enters into a contract. All right. So what is the information? Well, the first of all, it's a lead-based paint disclosure. There's one for landlord tenant, there's one for seller and buyer. So a seller or a landlord would have to provide that respective disclosure to a tenant or to a buyer prior to the purchase contract or the lease agreement being signed. Uh, the the lead-based paint addendum, addendums under the Code of Federal Regulation actually make them addendum number one to the purchase agreement and addendum number one to the, to the uh, lease agreement. And they must be given to the tenant or the, the purchaser prior to those contracts being signed. Otherwise, it creates a voidable contract. Number two, the, the renovator, the seller, or the landlord must provide any associated documents regarding lead-based paint. And that includes things like test results. Whether they were negative or positive, they have to be provided to that poten potential buyer or tenant. Now, buyers and not tenants here, buyers have a 10-day opportunity to have a lead assessment done at the buyer's uh, cost. The buyers have to pay for it. A seller cannot say no. Now, a seller may take a different offer. So if there are two offers on the property, one buyer is asking for the assessment, the other one is not, then the seller can legally take the one that is not asking for the assessment. But if there's only one offer and that, that buyer is asking for a, an assessment to be done, the seller cannot say no. Now, they can negotiate that 10-day opportunity, but now what are real estate agents required to do? Well, real estate agents must provide their buyers and or tenants. Now, remember, a tenant's legal name is a lessee. They must provide the buyer or the tenant the EPA's pamphlet called Protect Your Family from Lead in Your Home. That's the name of the, pa the pamphlet. Now, Please make sure that you're getting the pamphlet directly from the EPA's website so you, you have the most current up-to-date brochure because the EPA does update them from time to time. And now, last but not least is renovators. This includes landlords. If you're a landlord providing rental property, uh, then you are considered a renovator if you perform work on your own property. You must comply with the EPA's repair, I'm sorry, renovation, repair, and paint regulations. We commonly refer to that as the, is the RRP, RRP. I'm not going to go into detail here. That's for a different video. But landlords, property managers, you are considered a renovator if you do work on your own property. Therefore, you must follow the RRP regulations. If you're going to continue studying, check out this video right here. If you have not subscribed, please do so. Click the circle to the left. Comments, questions down below. See you all in the next video.